And now we're at our last session called Decentralized Reflections on Consensus. And this is an open Q&A. And I'll let Marco take the lead on this one. Yeah. So, so this doesn't have a real format, I would say. But I prepared two questions that I would like uh, first speakers that uh, are present. So I see Victor, Alfonso, Sergio. I don't see Arno, uh, Dankrad, and Sebastian. Maybe they join later. But basically, I, I will ask uh, two questions. So first, co first question, uh, I would like to get the response from the uh, presenters that are that are online, and then, you know, whoever raises the hand can chime in and uh, uh, basically give his view on the question. And I will ask just two of these questions, and then you know, others can ask. You know, hopefully this uh, starts the conversation, and then we have questions from others and not only me. So let's try this and, and see how it goes, right? So the first question is like uh, from the talks uh, that you see, that you that you heard from others today. Uh, like, what do you see, or, or, uh, like from top of the head? What could you use in your projects, and what what synergies do you see uh, between things that are presented today? So I'll give it to uh, Sergio because he started today. So let's go in the order. Yeah, thank you. So um, what I can see by comparing um, the talks that I attended to with the ones I, the one I delivered is mainly that we, so in the, in the in, at least in the work, we, of course, I, is, what I presented is just the work we've been working on, like a few, you know, a few of us. So Cosmos is way more than that. But what I realized that we tended to focus on, you know, on, on the, you know, below the interface of consensus. So in my talk, for instance, there is not much of like transfer funds contracts, and I can see that this is something that you know, you cannot ignore totally. And so, um, you know, um, some of the ideas that I've that I've uh, heard from other, like for instance, this um, speculative execution of contract is something that probably we need to, at least I know that we are modular, so we need to keep like, uh, you know, away from uh, tailoring our solutions below, you know, to whatever the applications do. But those are very good ideas to think about how we would be implementing our, in our, in our system. So, yeah. Uh, thanks, Sergio. So I guess uh, we have Alfonso in the order. Alfonso is present from the speakers. Yes. Yeah, so actually, I was excited to see a lot of the talks because I feel that at least from this our side, there are a lot of things that can be integrated. Uh, I mean, for instance, it would be cool to. I mean, we already explored the use of Tendermint as a consensus algorithm for subnets. It would be cool to see to what extent we can because we face some limitations and with A, B, C, I. I think that they're completely fixed. Like the fact that we need to to we had to do a lot of workarounds in order to send like sequential transactions and and like other limitations that Sergio already mentioned. That it would be really cool to test as a consensus in in our catalog of consensus algorithms in subnets. It would be really cool to have ABC plus plus instead of like our current ABCI uh, interface. Then for Dankrad, I think that it is clear data availability is one of our problems in Hargar consensus. I mentioned it. Um, we are exploring naive approaches right now. It would be great to see to what extent we can integrate already what Ethereum is doing and piggyback from all of their work. Um, then the next one was the, oh yeah, true. Like the, the one for, um, from Sebastian, I think it was the one state, that presented. State channels, yeah. The, the state channels. So this is uh, recurring, and, and I was discussing this with Marco a few days ago. This is a recurring uh, question, to what extent we can mix. So we have this fixed structure in our hierarchy where we have to go through all of the consensus engine and like all the subnets in order to propagate transactions, but there may be certain transactions that they can be sent through a payment channel or they can use, uh, even the atomic execution protocol can use the same semantics that they propose in, in their payment channel. So I don't know, I see a lot of, of uh, overlapping between all of the, the talks and all of the tech that that folks are proposing and our framework. But again, maybe I'm biased because I'm seeing like all of these building blocks that can be integrated. I don't know what others think. Thanks, Alfonso. Victor, do, would you like to say something? Yeah, sorry. Giving a talk pushes everything out of my brain, unfortunately. Um, but I do remember it's sort of like I have to like reintegrate things in my brain. Um, but I always actually been very interested in the Cosmos type stuff. I think that kind of the modularity of Cosmos has always been kind of very appealing to me. I, I didn't actually realize that um, 
that, that the ABI didn't talk to, you know, that there was no conversation between the consensus layer and the and the application layer for the proposal. So that was kind of new to me. I'm interested to understand how that really works um, better. So and there's lots of things like that. Um, I, I didn't quite get, I, I had to miss a little bit of some of the talks, but um, the state channel stuff sounded to me like it was definitely kind of um, stuff that was interesting. Like, you know, state channels are sort of related to the kind of things that we're doing, right? So um, I, I think that stuff was um, pretty cool. I, as I said, I didn't, I had to miss part of it. So unfortunately I couldn't, um, um, yeah. And as I said, I'm trying to integrate, remember like all the other stuff I listen to right now, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot too. I'm going to have to go through the talks again and like listen to them again. So I'm, I'm psyched for that though. Marco, may I maybe give a short answer to, um, you know, the Cosmos reference? Is it possible? Oh, yeah, yes, of course. Yes, of course. So, okay. so yeah, to, to reference of the cosmos. So yeah, I, I realized that in the presentation that I did, I left a lot of a lot of material outside, like of the existing things that uh, the ten mean interface or in the one in using <coughs> cosmos does. So so yeah, I'm, my, my presentation might have given the impression that today there is no conversation between the, the two levels. That is actually not correct. Like we have uh, check TX, for instance, so, so that we have. We have mechanisms today to make sure that to, to a certain extent, the transactions that we accept are valid. What we're doing now in this new work is to have strong guarantees. That's what we don't have, didn't have so far. We didn't, so far we didn't have a strong guarantee that given a transaction, this transaction, whatever it's proposed and decided is gonna be valid. And this is basically the, the extra mile we, we're walking in this, uh, you know, from ACI to ACI plus plus. So just wanted to, you know, to clarify that yeah, of course, we, we have talked, you know, the interface talks today. It's just that is probably in a less interesting way. And that's probably why I left it out of my presentation. <laughs> yeah, so I definitely want to, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, last time I looked at Cosmos was pre-pandemic, I think. So, um, you know, like, um, so I'm definitely interested to, um, to think about those kinds of issues. Thanks, uh, thanks, guys. So, any other participant wants to comment on this, like in in, in any like uh, you know, without uh, much uh, much form? Do you see any synergies between things that are presented today and uh, yeah? Okay, so let's let's go to my next question. It's it's a bit more uh, maybe controversial, hopefully. Uh, but uh, so when you develop your uh, the code for whatever your project is and uh, uh, of course it uh, relates to the ecosystems that you are working in but are you thinking about its usability in other ecosystem and are you like okay I, I really want uh, to make this uh, usable by other people like what's your philosophy of your projects with respect to that again let's go with Sergio Although That's I know a what he will, I, I can presume what he will answer, but let him answer. That is a tough one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one. So, yeah, I mean, um, so I have some familiarity with other ecosystems, to tell you the truth. Uh, um, I, we, so, of course, the main, the, our main customer is, you know, the Cosmos applications. That's for sure. That's basically what we focus on. So, so far, the work that I presented today has been focused on Cosmos. That's for sure. Um, what I can what I can say, but this is speculative. So we didn't. I mean, I have to be honest. We didn't give it a lot of uh, thought so far. Is that the fact that there is a clear that there is a, first of all like a specification, and then there is kind of a clear interface, which is basically what we have been doing now. You know, as long as this um, uh, as this is, is this interface can be assumed by another ecosystem in terms of what's sitting on top of consensus, it should be doable. But of course, uh, this is something we need probably to to spend some time thinking about um, and uh, probably discussing with the, um, you know, with the relevant people or on, on other ecosystems to see to what extent we can actually uh, make it usable for them. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sergio. Alfonso? I mean, I think I mentioned it in the talk, like I would love for all of these building blocks that we have to be usable somewhere else. Of course, we need to target somewhere <laughs> in the beginning, but if we can integrate, for instance, like the data availability from proposals from Ethereum right away in our system and like they can have uh, an alternative implementation of the SCA actor and all of the building blocks, it would be great. I mean, it, it will really foster the interoperability of the ecosystems. So 
at least personally, uh, that's our take, but of course you need to target a, an initial platform. And I, if I'm next, I think um, my answer is a little bit similar to Sergio's. Um, you know, I, I, I've been working at our grant, so I'm thinking about like, what are we gonna do for our stuff? It's already, you know, we're, we're already facing challenges with that. So um, that's definitely where we focused on. But I do um, think that one of the things that we've been thinking about is to write this up and, you know, like if you think about the structure we're saying, it's a very generic structure. The main thing that it's doing is, um, for in particular, for Augrand is saying, look, there are certain features that are really helpful in Augrand that help us do certain things. And we can just, because we have them, we can just rely on them. And so the main reason it won't port over to other places, I think, has to do with the fact that some other places don't have support for some of the things that we're using. And in fact, Augrand doesn't have support for some of the things we need. As I alluded to, there's some new features we need in Algorand to do that. And I think one of the virtues of our project, whether or not we do it, you know, it, you know, it, it becomes the, the main story for how we do things is that it's forcing us to basically say, this is functionality that we really need, that this is functionality we really need at layer one in order to do the things that we wanna do at layer two, not just our stuff, but other people's stuff as well. Um, you know, it's uh, the VRF checks to do certificate checking. I think this is, you know, in, er in order for people to have uh, elections, you know, any kind of election type things that people often want for various reasons, um, that's kind of support. This transaction try business, I think, is also something that's very useful. Um, one thing that Algorand has that I think most blockchains I feel like should just do because it's basically a, it's trivial for them to do. Um, it's just kind of an interface question. Which is this this atomic transaction business, right? I mean. A blockchain is already basically taking a whole bunch of transactions and making them as if they were atomic. So the hard part is done, right? You may as well just expose that in your interface so that, that, that you can actually specify that. Um, and, and then you can do atomic transfers without any, without, you know, like you can do three, four, one, whatever, you know, trades all together in one thing with, you know, with no extra kind of, without having to write a program to do it. Um, so it's kind of an interface question. So in that sense, I think, um, I haven't tried to think how it would work on any particular other chain, but but I'm trying to think, you know, I mean, I'm sort of an academic at heart, right? So I'm like trying to think what is the kind of the structure that we need in the underlying chain that we can do that we make interesting applications on the uh, above it. And in, in this sense, the layer two uh, speculative smart contract is an, is an application for us, you know, over our layer one chain. Does that make sense? I think it is. Yeah. Uh, any 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 comments on this uh, topic or any other question for for our speakers uh, from from the participants? Please don't be shy. Do we have something on Slack? I can see Slack now. Yeah. Uh, no, no, not yet. No. No questions on Slack. Yeah. Okay. I have a backup question, but then I'm really done. So we actually, can... I have something that is kind of okay. interesting to Go me, ahead. which is, um, I alluded to. I think one issue that I I I'd really like to understand better is storage. I think, um, like, uh, is how to do third party storage. Like, if I want to, if I want to, like, not put all the stuff on the blockchain, right? I just want to put small amounts of stuff on the blockchain. I move most of it off. What is a good way? I mean, I, I was kind of interested if people have ideas about how to do that well, because I think that's a huge problem. Like storage is a huge problem, right? Like, you know, um, how can we how can we do that well? How can we have like a third party? It's like a, it's an oracle, but it's a huge oracle, right? It's like an oracle with like tons of information. And I'm willing to keep, you know, I don't need, you know, I'm willing to keep a commitment yeah. on the chain, right? Like I'm, I'm willing to keep the Merkle roots of things or whatever it is, you know, on the chain in order to make sure that, you know, like, so I don't have to trust you to give me, but I need you to store it for me, right? Um, I think in some sense, Ethereum, and again, I, I don't mean any offense by this because Ethereum had to do something early on, right? But I think they kind of made a mistake in kind of selling storage in the way they did because you'd really like to charge, you say, look, you know, you, char you should charge ongoing fees for storing stuff because it costs me, you know, ongoing fees to keep your stuff, right? So, so you know, but, but how can we do that in a way that is... Um, you know, kind of compatible with all the systems we're building. Uh, you know, I, I guess so, maybe Filecoin has an answer to this kind of questions. I mean, I, I haven't really, I, I feel like I need to explore this better, but um, that is, I, as I kind of mentioned, 
it's on my list of things to do once we get this kind of prototype going. Um, so a, a suggestion I would have is maybe this um, project in Cosmos ecosystem called Celestia. I mentioned it mm. in my presentation and they are, you know, one of them, their strong points is that they come up with a solution for basically storage and it's very creative. I'm not going to elaborate now on them, but just as a, as a pointer, if you're interested, maybe I, I would advise you to, I can actually give you a link. to. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, because basically what, we're doing, what they're doing is that they are they're scaling the system as a true peer-to-peer -peer layer in the sense that they have some erasure code so that the information is redundant and they uh, probabilistically, you know, like like the, they, they have like clients that are querying, that are, you know, polling for, for, for data constantly. And so mm -hmm. as, the, as, the, as the network grows, so that's the probability, you know, the... I'd say this, like as the network, so, so they, bind, they bind the amount of storage they can have to the size of the network. So it all scales all together. And of course, the guarantees they give are probabilistic, but they are very good. That's all I can, I mean, I'm, I'm actually looking, looking into it because of, uh, you know, work-related um, um, tasks that I have. And so I'm, I'm really, yeah, I'm really surprised and like how, how, how well designed the thing is and it's stuck in storage. And actually I would have a, a question to you on, on your presentation when you were talking about uh, off-chain storage. And this is like, of course, I'm, I don't understand the details that, uh, you know, you guys are doing, <coughs> I try to follow doing the presentation, but my question is like, um, when we don't store things on chain, so we need to store it off chain. And basically you, as you said, like you tend to basically store some sort of a hash so that you at least can check whether what you have is a correct thing. So what do you th what do you do with nodes that need to catch up? Because, you know, and traditionally when you have a node that needs to catch up, you basically rely on the blockchain itself to basically try to catch up by executing everything. So is there a way to make it more efficient? Because that means, my view is that if you have external storage, so storage that is not like, even if it's local at each of the nodes, that's basically what you explained. Um, Basically, you cannot you cannot jump uh, like you have to do you know block by block right so that everybody is uh, reproducing the same store as the, all the other nodes. Uh, that my question there is like how do you deal with this with late nodes in terms of you know how you deal with this this, this storage that is not the things that are not stored on the blockchain. Yeah, so I, I have a, a kind of a, a bad answer to it and a hopefully better answer to it. So the bad answer is we don't do that at all. Right now, we just say you're you're running everything. You know, like we're I said we're in a prototype implementation. We're not doing that at all. Uh, but a, a, a slightly better answer to that is, and then I'll try and refine it after that, is um, that first of all, um, we're keeping a commitment for each contract, right? And you don't need to run the whole blockchain. If someone says, here's the current state of the world, Right? If they just write out the state of the world to you, you, you can verify that, right? No problem, right? So, of course, if the state of the world is huge, then it's a problem. But I mean, but if the state of the world is huge, you have to get it anyway. So, I mean, like, you know, yeah. I'm not sure how we can do much better. Yeah, um, basically, you, you exploit... could do better is we could ask for smaller pieces. Like, as I said, if my yeah. commitments were, like, more... That's actually what I'd like to kind of say. I'd like to say, right now, we just say, if I want something, I say, please give me the whole storage for that contract, right? Um, that, that seems to me... Uh, uh, like not a good idea. I mean, like we're imagining that these contracts are data intensive. I mean, there's some that are competition, but if we're imagining these are data intensive contracts, right? Then we'd really like to say, please give me a little piece of your, yeah. <laughs> a little piece of it, right? But that, you know, we'll do it on an individual basis, I guess. We haven't kind of worked out that story. That's the storage story I would like to work out. But I don't have to catch up, right? I can just, you, you can just give me the whatever I need yeah. and I can verify it's the right stuff. So, so, so I don't so need to run. So basically you, your, your second answer is like the, the first answer I totally understand and that's a correct way of doing it, of course. Uh, your second answer, what I understand is that you are exploiting the orthogonality of the transaction. So you don't need to care about the whole world, only the, you know, you are supposed to be understanding the transactions or at least those that are of interest to you. And you basically just follow those transactions. Is, is that, is that the, uh, okay. That's, that's part of it. That's true. That's we're doing that from one part, but that's, that's not all of it. The other reason that you, you get better off is we're actually exploiting the fact that the blockchain is underneath the covers, right? So the reason in a blockchain, you need to run the whole blockchain is because who gets to vote is something that changes over time, right? If that was fixed, then I wouldn't need to do that. I just say, please tell me the guys and I just go there, right? But the problem is I need to go all the way along because who's because I won't know who had the right to vote at any time without going, you know, so that's changing. And the only way I can know who had to vote is I can see who had the right, right, right to vote before them that voted them into office, who voted the next guys into office. That's the only reason I need to run it. If I didn't need to do that, I could just say, here's the state of the chain, right? Like here's a, here's a hash, right? You know, here, and I'm claiming that this is the current ledger state. Right, so if you trust that this is the that this is the hash of the ledger state, right? Then 
then I can give you the ledger saying you can see it's correct and you don't have to look at the past, the past history, right? And this is true for any blockchain, right? If, is we have these safe points somehow, we, you know, like, you know, like the Genesis block is in some sense a, a, a kind of a, def, de, uh, what is the word for that? Like a devolved, whatever, you know, like a, a, a de, 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 degenerate uh, safe point, right? But if, yeah. you know, if somehow you said at, at, at year 2022, you know, this was a safe point. Everyone says, yes, that, that's effectively like a new genesis block. We never have to go before that again, right? In our case, the blockchain is doing that for us. And we're always writing the commitments in. So we, we, as long as the blockchain underlying is good, you're caught up with the blockchain underlying, these guys never have to look back at history. They don't care. They just want to know what this current state of the world is. Um, so so it, the... The, the part where I don't have to run the thing, that's just because of blockchain. The part where I don't need to take in the whole world, that's because we've divided up the world in, into these contracts. And as I said, I think we'd actually like to divide even contracts worlds into smaller worlds so I can get like part of their, con you know, so please just verify this part of your state, you know, and Merkle tree like things as opposed to like some silly monolithic kind of commitment that we're doing now. Um, because it's just, you know, it doesn't matter for our purposes yet. We're just doing prototype. Um, but I think yeah, even I in version one, we'll probably have a Merkle root-like thing rather than, you know, whatever. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thanks for that. I would also chime in myself to answer this storage question. Of course, uh, Filecoin uh, network is relevant for this. So basically, I don't know how much you know about Filecoin consensus, but the way it works is the civil attack protection is essentially the reservation of storage capacity. And uh, after that, we basically build a power table similar to proof of stake. And then it's a weighted game of uh, similar to proof of stake, but it's not stake. Like no one stakes file coin in order to uh, gain power as a validator of the network, but it depends actually on the amount of storage. And how then... fast is the, how fast is the storage? Like how fast can I get stuff back from it? Uh, basically that, uh, that really depends, right? So, uh, Alfonso, do you have a, to help me with the top of the head numbers? I mean, it really depends on, on the girl, like not so fast, I would say. I mean, you're typing minutes, hours, seconds, no, microseconds. <laughs> what order of magnitude are we talking about? That's, that's what I want to know. No, we are definitely talking, no, no talking min minutes and, and hours, right? So, so we, we are talking something less, right? We are yeah, talking about durability, right? Of yes. storage. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. So it depends on the state of the. Uh, of the content because miners or, or service providers they can have the content a, a hot copy or a cold copy a hot copy is is unsealed and like ready to be served and there is just uh, the transaction through the wire and then when it's a cold copy which means that it's sealed inside a sector stored like with all of the all of the mechanics of Falcon it may take a bit more. I don't know, like the numbers, it's been improved a lot. I don't know the numbers of the ceiling. George, I don't know if you have the numbers from the top of your head. Yeah, I, I was trying to recall. I don't, it used to be hours because it sectors are very large. Like, I mean, sectors are, are, are quite large, yeah. exactly, yeah. irrespective of the data that you're retrieving and you have to unseal the entire sector. So yeah, but, but by the way, just the ceiling uh, notation. So sealed uh, capacity is the one that actually counts to 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 the power in Filecoin, right? But so uh, miners are encouraged to keep a hot copy. So basically uh, an equal copy of the data they store, but just in plain text, right? So so not, not sealed. And that allows for instant retrieval, yes. At the cost of obviously twice the storage space. And, and then like uh, we can think of, so when you say retrieve content, you may be interested in just one point of the sectors, but memories map in sectors as in like traditional memories, which means that you would have to unseal the whole sector in order to access the specific data. If the if is if it is the case that the the service provider doesn't have the the sector in a hot copy and, and cache. So what do you charge people with... differently, whether it's in cold copy or hot copy to get the thing, or do you just charge them? So you have to know whether it's in cold or hot in order to do this. You would make a bid. So there's an ask and bid. Uh, there's an order book I see. Of, of requests and you would make a bid. Like you would know the, the kind of prices that the, that the service provider requests. But of course, there's a problem, which is uh, the r ransom of data. Because I could say you that I will have, I mean, I will ask only for two file coins. But then once you come to retrieve the data, I have raised the minimum bid to so there's still things to figure out 
regarding the yeah. retrievability, but the, the data availability, so the, the fact that the content is stored, you can be sure because of the protocol. Then re the retrievability, we are working on that because there are certain edge cases that could make it hard, but yeah. But I, I would say this is improving progressively in Filecoin, right? So so this is why my first answer was depends, but then, then it, uh, you know, uh if you go to retrieval.market uh, this is basically the the sub team in uh, in one of the sub teams actually because we are doing if you're working on different uh, retrieval incentivization and market solution so basically retrieval.market gives you an overview of like approaches uh, to the questions basically that you're concerned in the filecoin ecosystem yeah, I mean, I don't think we'd want it for really hot things, like really hot things we're keeping in storage, right? Like, you know, like the, the nodes that are executing are keeping in storage, right? They don't need to ask anyone else for it. It's sort of kind of cold or semi-cold things, you know, that, that you know that, that they don't want to keep, right? Um, what it suggests to me is that, like, I'm trying to think what would be the right interface because, you know, it will leak out to the, to, the, to the programming language, right? But it seems like there might be useful to have a notion of a prefetch, like to say, please warm up the stuff I need, right? Like, you know, thaw them out now so that, you know, tomorrow I'm going to come in. If it takes hours, right? For instance, you know, we might say, oh, now is the time we're going to do it, right? Let, let's thaw the stuff out now so that they'll be ready for us when it comes. And that might be an interface that people build in because they understand that that contracts work this way. If they have third-party storage, if they're saying, yes, I'm agreeing to put things over here. Um, but we have to think for ourselves how to do that as well. It's, it's, that's actually the complication of storage. I think it's, it's a lot. It's just deciding what the right interfaces for it are. It makes sense. I mean, yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I guess our approach with, with Filecoin is to build capacity first. So we were capacity oriented. And now the focus is like we have a 70 megabytes of capacity basically in the network. And now when with all this capacity, it's, it's shifting towards other things, uh, towards usability, retail markets and other things. And then the consensus lab works on, on, on a, complementary set of problems like uh, scalability and all the stuff that we're discussing today. And, and I had another comment maybe, uh, and please prepare questions uh, from the audience. Per, please prepare questions if you have. So, so other comments, yes, I mean, uh, I completely agree. So we should just store on chain only like critical data, checkpoints, commitments and whatnot and store other data like off chain and maybe it's it's like in like in classical systems you're probably looking into tiered storage systems and victor you said like uh, you know your validators are storing like essentially caching in some sense the data uh that they need as hot data but then you would like uh, postpone other things to like cold storage to other networks and that makes sense like in any storage uh, system design yeah. like tier, tier storage right Any other questions, comments? I guess people are getting tired and we are like uh, dissipating. So what I, what I was suggesting- Maybe use the comment or- Go ahead, Giuliano, please, yes. It's kind of a general comment, but it, 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 it seems that um, people are more interested or working more on um, scaling execution rather than ordering. Is, 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 is that something- Ordering? That yeah, so, so you have the problem of ordering transactions like as a, really in the consensus algorithm, and then you have the problem of executing them. And it seems that a lot of scaling solutions are focused on uh, scaling execution. I don't know, is that, a, is that a more important problem in your view or? I guess, what, what is the issue with ordering? I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I'm just missing the, the what's, why is that a scalability problem? Well, consensus itself, uh, ordering transactions, even if you don't execute them, could be a, a bottleneck, right? And so, you so, know, we, we we've seen stuff like uh, in the past, like Narwhal, which really speeds up ordering, but uh, doesn't do anything about execution. And then maybe it, it's a, a solution to a non-problem if if your bottleneck is execution. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so the the solution that uh, I presented. Um, deals with that with, deals with that problem it's not the core of it but it deals with it in the sense that it's this part where i explained that you would simplify the decide interface and therefore now the application is free to execute you know it has a whole block so it's free to execute the transactions in the order or even in parallel as it thinks it's correct and still deterministic uh, i didn't touch a lot on that because that's highly dependent on, on the application that you put so the, the the blockchain that you put on top uh, but that's something like 
some some improvement with respect to the status quo. The part that we are not tackling there is ordering transactions across blocks. So you're still executing one block after the other. I, I got a question on pipelining, et cetera. We haven't dealt with that. So this is still up in the air. How we're not going you know, deal with that. So, so, so you, you are free to order your, your transactions within your block when you deliver, when you receive it as an application. However, the part that we are not dealing with yet is or, or, transaction reordering across blocks. That's basically, you, you still have, you know, you still have to execute one block after the other. And you're reordering them because you think that that will make the things go faster or you think that it... for instance yeah that's depending on what those transactions mean the obvious you know in terms of performance the obvious example is and we we touched on this a, a little bit a little before if you remember is this orthogonal so if you have transactions that are orthogonal so basically you can just run them in parallel if, if possible. Oh, sorry, a parallel execution, I, I totally understand. I'm just trying to understand if there's anything other than parallel execution that you're hoping to get from ordering. I mean, I can imagine a couple of other things. For instance, one is co-leasing, right? Like you say, here's a bunch of transactions that are all riding this guy. I just have to write the last one, right? Like, yeah, for instance, yeah, that uh, would be one, yeah. So that sort of obliterating stuff and also commuting stuff. Um, but yeah, is there so, something else? I'm just trying to understand if there's some other kinds so, of things beyond those two. What I was trying to say is that in, in, in our previous system you could not do that because you were delivered one transaction at a time so you were basically tied to the ordering right. that the block imposed now we are free to do the kind of things that you are that you're thinking about um other things other things that might uh, matter in terms of ordering would be like um if you cannot guarantee that all your transactions are valid as they are as in their place in block so you know we we also discuss about this Maybe at this at decision time, you might find an ordering to maximize the, the number of transactions that are valid. This is not, this is not, this is more validity related than performance related, but yeah, it's something you can, as long as you are deterministic, you can do. So I will say that in Algorand, we switched to a system that was more aggressive about ordering. That is basically, we put them, we basically build the block in the order that we receive them, right? Like we just do it like, you know, like as soon as it comes in, we either throw it out or put it as it's the next guy. We queue it up. And then when it's time, our time to do the product, we just chop off the, the front of the queue and say, these are the guys who go in. Um, and so it's a it's a very simple system where we used to have a more complicated system. Um, I can't, you know, like there was some idea that we do something more complicated, but we, we simplified it because that just made admission control and kind of handling the data structures easier. Um, now, it might be that, you know, Algorand's blockchain is um, not um, at capacity, let's just say, right? And so, you know, maybe if we were at capacity, we would have different issues. But um, because we're not at capacity, this is, you know, the kind of simplest. It does mean that whenever a block comes in, we have to basically go through the block and kind of chop out all the stuff that was, you know, like that was in our queue, right? And say, whatever, hopefully it's mostly the same. And then, and then all the stuff that kind of got orphaned, we have to, Re, we recheck. Um, and so I, I, I kind of alluded to earlier, but we actually distinguish between the checks that we have to redo and the checks that we don't have to redo. Um, you know, because like, for instance, if we're checking signatures, we don't have to redo that, right? If, if we check the signature before, it's still good, it's fine. If we don't, but, but the stuff that we, the stuff that depends on the block state, blockchain state, the ledger state, you know, that stuff we have to rerun. And so, um, it might be useful if there was enough stuff to kind of have them remember who, which things they depend on. So you can say, oh yeah, I don't need to do anything because these guys are all not dependent on anything, you know, um, to keep basically a DAG of dependencies along the way. But, um, but it's, it's not obvious to me. Narwhal, as I recall, sort of basically only puts things in when the kind of the, the knowledge is, we know what's going to happen. So, um, uh, you know, it's kind of building a dependency graph along the way. And then I think I, I, I didn't entirely, I was unfortunately, I listened to a talk, they gave, they gave us a talk, which was nice of them, but um, I, I was unfortunately in transit at the time. So I had kind of um, not the best ability to listen to, comprehend it, let's just say. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it seemed to me that Narwhal really allowed you to order transactions at a super high rate. But, but that might not be of any use to you if then you cannot execute them at this rate. Um, and so 
I was wondering what, what the sense is, is whether the scalability bottlenecks are mostly in the ordering layer or, or in the execution layer. I, I, yeah. I would say I would say they are in both places, but like you know, we we started this basically from leader-based protocols uh, like TBFT style. You know, and as you scale and grow the network, of course, you're not going to have uh, great performance, right? And then, uh, so, so you need to work on both problems in parallel. It's like I guess there is a race, and it, it's some problem. One problem is more important, and the other problem is more important depending on what is the progress on both. It, it know, depends on your particular system. Yes, and in the specification, like uh, how how you know what's the how much CPU do you have in a node? What's the computing power and whatnot, right? And there is this other part which is related. Okay, fine. Let's assume that you do whatever the best you can do, and if you still execute on a single node, you're bottlenecked by whatever a single node can do, right? And at that point, you are looking at sharding, uh, partitioning, uh, the subnet solutions, and etc. And and you kind of need to combine all of this to get a to get a full answer, right? And I guess we are all working on some components of it, which is the point of, of an event like this to bring us together. So one thing that's interesting um, from uh, Cosmos that I again learned today uh, is that because the transactions are not validated, right, um, before the, they're agreed to, right? This also I think is true. It was surprised to me. This is true in the Narwhal slash, um, I can't remember what the other talk was about system. They're basically saying, here's all the transactions, but some of them might not be valid. I've already decided they're in the block and you just take the block and throw them out. We don't do that. We basically only put valid things in the block. So we just throw them out preemptively if they're not valid. Um, uh, and then and then we reassess, but maybe we didn't, but that means that we are, that, you know, it's gotta be this, you know, the steps have to be taken in order, right? And it's currently not because we're not full up. It's currently not a problem for us, I think. But um, maybe it will be a problem if we were sort of at our limits of what could be done. Um, so just to answer, um, so yeah, I mean, today we have um, ways to filter invalid transactions. So like most of the time in practical terms, uh, Cosmos uh, chains won't, you won't find invalid transactions in the, you know, in blockchain. So those two, those that made it to the decide uh, stage. The problem we're trying to solve here is taking that to uh, to formal guarantees. Like like today, it's highly unlikely that you're gonna find an invalid transactions in a Cosmos blockchain. With ABC++, we have it formally impossible if you structure your application the way we suggest you should structure it. So right. just to make it clear. So it's not like half of our transactions are invalid or something like this like only but, but in yeah, extreme but... cases is extreme like con concurrent crisis that would because we have we have something it's something we didn't include today because this is still there and so it didn't change so i didn't want to focus on that but we have this check tx api where basically every every transaction that reaches uh, a node first is checked with the application whether it that transaction in isolation makes sense and where you check balances and stuff and also format and signatures and this is this is this is true today and it it didn't change that's that's why i didn't basically talk about it because it, it didn't change we already right. had it we, we we keep on having it the problem with that is that that check is not done it's not guaranteed to be done at the right place which mm -hmm. means that some concurrency some some concurrency misfortunes may make you accept uh like for instance you are you know there is alice bob and charlie and they are transferring tokens and there is some sort of ordering there where you check them independently they they all look good when you finally make it to the you know to the blockchain you realize that one of the one of the transactions actually because of its ordering cannot be cannot be executed but this is yeah. today today this is the exception and not the rule so please don't get don't walk away with the impression that you know like loads of uh, transactions are invalid that's because if i understand you correctly the the um consensus node isn't like generally consulting with the other guy but he's got a function ahead of time from the other guy saying all your guys should pass this function right yeah so it's it's like not part of the dynamic interface but it's part of the static interface in which the application does have a way to tell the 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 um the uh, consensus node just filter out all the guys who don't meet this right like the, 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 what changed, what is changing with uh, the work we I presented is that now you are in a position to evaluate whether a transaction is is valid right at its place in the blockchain, right. even if we haven't started like talking about whether this is finally going to be the block or not. This is something we didn't right. have before. So we have right. but before, like, for, I formal guarantees. 
But before I had a way to give you a function that said, here's like a preliminary check. You can do this check. And if it fails this check, just throw it out, right? Like Yeah, and it was right. up to the application to see to what extent it wanted to do checks in advance. And so there yeah. are some applications, for instance, where what they are doing is they are doing that, that, that check by like assuming that that you know like they have kind of a copy of the state and they basically uh, execute the actual transactions against that like tentative state uh, in order to for instance uh, exclude transactions you know do more advanced checks but again what we have today formally you cannot say that you can guarantee 100 percent that no invalid transactions will ever make it to the blockchain whereas now we can right without losing how to say this without losing on performance or having to stop anything i mean there is no mm -hmm. big like this is something that is coming like the new design is allowing us with no uh, imp with no um, pers with no important cost or no import no no trade off to to go through. Like it right. is actually coming. It's all good. I, I would be tempted to to say for for free. Nothing is for free. We know, but it's like the way we have restructured it that allows us to now be able to do that, whereas before we couldn't. Right. That's, again, that sounds great. Again. Again, like uh, we we were still, you know, today we're still checking transactions, and most of the time, is it's very hard to it's very hard to come up to come up in 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 production cosmos chains, very hard to come up with um with an actual case where that transaction actually made it to the to the blockchain. Yeah, that's good. That's good to know. I mean, like I said, in Algorand we do distinguish between checks that we can do statically and checks that we can't do statically. Um, you know, but we don't have the problem that you guys have, which, which we're trying to, we're not trying to be one for everyone, right? Like, yes. so we can say, you know, I mean, that's, that's what causes you trouble, right? You have to say, please, Mr. Application, tell me what, you know, exactly. give me some gift, right? Exactly. And this is somehow the price. will affect how much crap I give you back. Yeah. This is um, the price we're paying for being fully modular, if you want, like right. to have, having this clean limit between what we uh, call consensus. Uh, and what we call the application, which tends to right. be a blockchain with its own, you know, with its own right. ideas. Yeah. So we have some of this problem, but it's it's less because we have a specific guy we're talking about and we can yeah. tailor it to that specific guy. Yeah. Great, great stuff. Uh, so do we have more questions from the audience? If not, I think we can wrap up 10 minutes earlier. It's, it's been a long, but very, very interesting day. day. Uh, so thank you. Thanks for the speaker. Thanks a lot for organizing this. Um, there, you guys will eventually post, I imagine, all the videos, right? So that we yes. can yes. rewatch them. Yes. We actually intend to post them still today. I'm not making any promises, but the goal is for them to go on YouTube still today.